Dear colleagues, it's such a pleasure to be here with you today and I'm honored to introduce you to the first European webinar entirely dedicated to subthreshold laser and organized by the Subthreshold Ophthalmic Laser Society, SALTS. We want to thank Lumibird for supporting today's webinar, but it is very important to highlight that all the speakers are using different devices. We want to thank all the speakers for taking the time today to give their talks and to support the discussions. And finally, we want to thank uh, Jeannie and Kenny from SOLS for organizing this webinar and to be the heartbeat of SOLS. So I'm Dr. Barbara Parolini, and uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker of the webinar, Dr. Alejandro Figlioi Rius from Spain. He will speak about the basic of micropulse laser, the rationale of mechanism, uh, and uh, why we do what we do. Please, Alejandro. Thank you, Barbara. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. All right. So I assume the you can see all well my presentation. It's a pleasure to be here, as and as Barbara stated, it's the first uh, webinar that solves you organized from you know, an European level. So my talk is going to be mostly about the basics, about the basics of two aspects. How does it work? How does subthreshold achieve its effect? And from it, from the reasons why it works, the reasons why do we administer, we deliver laser the way we do. Those are my disclosures. First of all, let's go to the basic of terminology. We refer to subthreshold laser to as any technology which in which we do not have, we do not see any clinically visible effect on the retina, such as pigmentary, inflammatory, or any other structural changes in fundoscopy, on OCT, on autofluorescence, or anywhere else. Well, we of course can see the results of it, but we do not see your classic changes, your classic burns, the those changes of, the, of your classical laser. Right? That's because the laser effect remains under the threshold of the minimum energy required to produce any physical damage, hence the term subthreshold lasers. Currently, uh, all the lasers that we have that can qualify for subthreshold laser achieve so by delivering the laser not as a continuous pulse, but as a train of very short bursts separated by cooling periods. periods during which there is no laser energy delivery, which allows for, for to prevent for a, the accumulation of critical heat that would result in this burning, this coagulation, in these visible changes, visible scars. I'm sure you've seen this, this drawing more than once. So, and it's, and it's very good, right? We, when we have achieved a laser that is able to warm the retina without burning it, but why do we want? What is it useful at all? Well, that's because we know that we, we stimulate tissues, retina among them, under the threshold of real physical damage. We know that we stimulate reparative changes, local changes at the level of, of cell metabolism, not architectural, not visible, but something is definitely happening there. Happening there, We know that the subthreshold stimulus causes an increase in the secretion of anti-inflammatory, antioxidative, and restorative molecules through the stimulation of RPE and, and, or, and more indirectly, mirror cells. We know it's been researched both, both in vivo, in vitro, as is the case for in, in Agaki and company, and in vivo. We know that there is changes of these molecules in the aqueous of patients treated with subthreshold laser. So I would like to take this single message. You want to choose one from my talk that laser burn when regarding macular laser. I'm not talking about PRP. That's another mechanism. That's another topic. But when regarding the macular laser 
for the treatment of retinal disease, the laser burn has no intrinsic therapeutic value. Hence, it's not necessary. It's not a necessary evil as it had been classically contemplated. So to under denomination subliminal or whatever other um, commercial denominations, a threshold laser works under two principles. First, it causes a response from the targeted tissue in the form of production of anti-inflammatory and restorative molecules, and it must be invisible at any moment. You cannot see it in the fundus, you cannot see it on OCT, you cannot see it on autofluorescence. If you see, see it, something has gone wrong. You only must be able to see the results. Otherwise, it will not qualify for suppression. So how should it look? It should not look at all, right? Like in this case of diabetic macular edema, you should only be able to see the results in the resolution of the exudates. Here you can see some spots, but they belong from an older treatment, which you can also see in the first photo, was done with, with an old laser. So, knowing this, knowing how a laser becomes a threshold, what does it mean for it to be subthreshold, and knowing why why do we want it to be subthreshold, how do we deliver it, right, to have the maximum chances of a of a good of good results? The learning curve is not that steep for anybody minimally used to apply applying macular laser, but there is a few key changes. All right here, we are not using a thermal laser to burn a specific lesion or to treat a specific leaking point. Here, you are stimulating cells of the RPE in order for them to become, uh, in order for them to become, let's say, little factories of of molecules of clinic clean, of mm, of clinically significant interest. So since the production capabilities of a few cells is very low, you need to treat a lot of cells. So you need to treat relatively large areas and you need to treat it entirely, densely, by putting the spots right one next to each other. So you do not leave any blank spaces. You, let's say, recruit as many cells as you can. And of course, you have to select the appropriate power. And this is, Perhaps the reason to be of souls, the reason this society was to try to establish consensus in how to deliver this kind of treatment, because there is many investigative groups around the world treating with a threshold laser. It's, it's like everyone has its own way of doing it. Uh, there is a bit of a chaos or disagreement. So we put together a group, uh, as large as possible group of specialists from all over the world, really using different devices to try to reach some degree of consensus. And that's why the first publication of our group, which is freely available on our website, are those guidelines. Those guidelines come from a not full consensus, but from the closer that we have been able to. And let, let's check on every, every one of the parameters. We're going to move from less to more controversial. Regarding new to cycle and pulse duration, that was a no-brainer. Practically everybody today is working 5% to 100 milliseconds, which means an effective laser time of 10 milliseconds. Spot size between 100 and 200 microns. That depends on, on the machine, on the kind of, um, of choices that you have available. And everyone also agreed that you have to treat densely. Do not leave any blank space between the spots. You want to, as we mentioned earlier, recruit as many cells as possible. Power here is start. It's one starts uh, some, some degree of disagreement. Also, in our publication, most of us, publication says that we recommend tight ration. Still many specialists treat today with fixed powers uh, and with good results. But why do we mean by titration? By titration, we mean that to individually calibrate the energy necessary for every case. We do this by doing small single spots in the peripheral, in the peripheral healthy macula until we see a minimal, minimally visible burn. And then we work at a 50% a fraction of that power. Why those of us that work 
with titration do it? Well, it prevents you from the variability between patients. I mean, likely color fundus patients will not absorb energy as much. And it takes into account the fact that laser cavities weaken with time. Anyway, as I mentioned, there is many good specialists that work without titration with good results. So it's not perhaps the most important point. Just a very quick recap on our recommendations on DME and CSC. Massie and Stella will go through much more, much more thoroughly at it. About DME, we agreed that you can use subthreshold laser both center and non-center involving with or without combination with intravitreal drugs that you must treat all over the dematose area and a little bit around and do your first check of results after six or eight weeks and consider your retreatment after 12. Regarding central serums, consider it apt both for chronic and acute forms, for acute to wait at least for one month, that is a perfectly good first-line treatment, and you should lead over and widely, it's impo this is important, widely around the leakage point, and you can check for results of six, eight weeks, and then is when you can consider retreatment. Let me show you. No, before that, before a couple of examples, just safety points. Regarding one of the classical um, controversial points with this transphobial treatment, we agreed that to not encourage it. I mean, literature and expertise demonstrating that it's safe, in, it's safe if it's an, in under expert hands, but it is not necessary to do it to achieve good results. Why? I mean, four is small to cover it and surrounding area, you need four or five spots. Our treatment usually go around three, four, six, eight hundred spots. So if the treatment fails, it's not going to be for those three or four less spots that you have used that you have quit yourself from using to not cover the phobia. After treatment, especially after your first treatments, check very carefully for any visible burns. If you see anything, just lower your parameters. And there's this extra point regarding fluence. Fluence is this concept, which is the mathematical combination of parameters that results in an energy density. Depending on the device you work with, it might directly inform you, inform you of it. Anything under 12 joules per square centimeter is going to be safe for virtually everybody, perhaps very darkly pigmented fundi or very thin retina would be an exception. Between 12 and 20, they are mostly all right as this, and it is over 20 joules when you start having a certain risk of visible changes. Titration, we could add here, works as an extra safety measure because then you can get yourself a good idea of how much energy is that patient absorbing. Let me show you a couple of examples. We've seen this DME case before, I'm going to see an aesthetic example and a video example. Here, we select our spot size, perform the titration, few small single spots until we can see visible changes. Then we reduce our power. And before treating, just one quick fluence check, just to make everything, just to make sure that everything's in place and we can start re treating. These squares represent the patterns that will be filled with spots as you will see in the video. So you can see we cover very generously all the affected area because that's the way to obtain results with subthreshold. Number one cause of bad results has been identified to be a too small number of spots. We have to change our mindset regarding the thermal laser. We, here we are not hitting a bullseye. Here we are massaging a large area to put it to work for us. Let me show another more example. This one we would, be, would be for CSCR. This is the area we would like to cover generously all around. Let's see how it looked in real life. All right, first of all, titration. Put ourselves in the peripheral macula and perform discrete spots, increasing power until we can see very small changes, all right? That's what we refer to as a minimally visible burn. Then we decrease the power 50%, prepare our pattern, focus well, it's very important to focus you at the level of the RPE, and start delivering. As you can see, one spot right next to each other. The automated or semi-automated lasers, of course, make it so much easier. 
I like to begin the furthest from the Mac, not from the center that I am planning to work, and then work my way my way towards center. All right, video was lagging a little bit. Sorry about that. This is a slightly edited video. Real life treatment is a little bit longer, but not much. As you can see, when showing the full of it, just a little bit of every corner to highlight the fact that we must be very thorough when it comes to cover the area. As, we, as you can see here, we do not only cover the area with subretinal fluid, but also a little bit around it, including the healthy retina. There is not, not such thing as over treatment with subthreshold laser. Regarding number of spots, of course, regarding power, that's another topic. Overlapping spots, which is a usual question, is not a problem. So you can see we have treated around the center in a spiral fashion. And this would be it. So, conclusion sub threshold laser works by stimulating a reparative response from the RPE towards the retina, which renders the scars caused by conventional thermal laser unnecessary. So, they must be avoided. They, they bring nothing to the table. Regarding our guidelines, guidance and consensus are key to provide reproducibility and soundness to any therapeutical technique. So, the, the more the merrier. And the step, step by, and step by step technique is probably the safest approach, both for the beginner and the expert. And this would be me. This would be all about my presentation. Make sure that you check our on our website for more educational content. Thank you.